my name is Rebecca Sluth, and I am the author of the book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. I first learned of Henrietta Lacks in herself while taking a community college biology course for high school credit. I found the woman in herself mind-blowing, and I was determined to learn more. As I furthered my education, I learned more about Kila Sells, but no more about Henrietta, except that she was a black woman. After researching Henrietta, herself, and her family, I dedicated my life to learning more about the women who felt to change the field of science forever. I wrote the book based on knowledge I gained from my travels, researching, and interviews with those closest to Henrietta and her cause. I interviewed members of her family, most often her daughter, Deborah. Because of Deborah, I tried to keep the book, its stories, and language as close to real people and events as possible, because otherwise, my entire book and the black entire story, as Deborah said, would be dishonest. I was born in Roanoke, Virginia on August 1st, 1920. Although I was giving the name Loretta Fleming, over time it became Henrietta Lack. My mom died when I was little, and my father couldn't take care of us anymore, so I went to live with my grandfather, Tommy Lack, in the farmland of Clover, Virginia. I grew up surrounded by all of my cousins. One of my cousins, Day, would later become my cousin. Another of my cousins, Sadie, is still my best friend today. Up until sixth grade, I went to school every day. But when I stopped going to school, I would work in the field, and in the evening, I would be with my cousins. We'd play games, tell stories, and go to the swimming hole. I started having babies with Day when I was 14. Our first son was named Lawrence, and our first daughter was named Elsie. Elsie was kind of simple-minded. She was kind of funny in the head, and it got to the point where I couldn't take care of her anymore. So we had to send her to a special home. I think about her every day, and I hope that she's doing all right. When I was 20, Day and I got married. We moved up north to a steel processing facility where Day could work because business was booming because of the war. It was while living up north that I discovered a painful lump in my cervix. I went to the doctor, and he sent me to the big hospital, Johns Hopkins. After a bunch of tests, they found out that I had cancer. At first, I didn't want to bother anybody about it, so I only told Sadie. I try to go on with life as normal, but it's getting hard because the, free the treatments are frequent, painful, and are causing my skin to char a deep black. I'm nervous, and I don't understand everything the white doctors say, but I can tell things aren't going well. I hope there's still a chance the cancer will go away because I have a family to raise. Hello, I am Dr. Howard W. Jones, and I was the gynecologist on duty when Henrietta came to the hospital when she discovered that she had something wrong with her. I noticed that she had a hard mass that was the size of a nickel, and it was shiny and purple like grape jello, and it was so delicate that it would leave the slightest touch. So I cut a sample and sent it to the lab so they could give me a diagnosis, and then I sent her home. She received the same treatment that any white patient would have. She had a biopsy and radium treatment and the radiation. Later on, when I was writing an article for Dr. Guy's retirement, I went back to look at Henrietta's files and realized that her cancer was incorrectly diagnosed at the time. I realized that her tumor was actually different and that the pathologist had misinterpreted it. Her tumor was invasive and was diagnosed wrong when she first had it. It was a very aggressive adenina carcinoma of the cervix, and that explained why it spread through her body so quickly. It wouldn't have affected her treatment, but it explained why it was so fast. Hello, I'm Dr. Richard Wesley Salins, and I am the boss of the Dr. Jones, who treated Henrietta Lacks. I am currently involved in the nationwide debate about whether cervical cancer is, in fact, an uh, invasive cancer. In 1951, I developed a theory about cervical cancer that, would be, that, if it was correct, would save millions of lives. I treated cervical cancer aggressively, often removing the cervix, uterus, and vagina because I thought it re would reduce the death from cervical cancer. I often used documents from public wards to do research without telling my patients. Hello, I am Dr. Lawrence Wharton, Jr., and I was the doctor that operated on Henrietta when she had cervical cancer. In order to do this, I dilated her cervix and then prepared to treat the tumor. No one told Henrietta that I was doing this, but Dr. Guy told me to shave two dime-sized pieces from her cervix 
one from her tumor and one from a healthy cervical tissue so that he could run tests on them. I slipped a tube of radium inside her cervix and sewed it into place, and that would be her treatment. Hi, my name is Dr. George Gay, and I was born in 1899 on a hillside in Pittsburgh overlooking a steel mill. I earned a biology degree at the University of Pittsburgh, and in my second year of medical school, my mentor and I um, discovered how to capture the first five cells on film. After graduation, my wife Margaret and I built our first lab in a Janitor quarter quarters in the John Hopkins Hospital. It was there that um, we figured out how to produce the first immortal cells of Henrietta Lacks. Spreading like crabgrass, Margaret had explained. My wife Margaret is a cell cultural nurse. Some say it was her work toward preventing contamination that was the only reason why our cells could even grow in a lab. Um, she taught me everything I knew about keeping cells in sterile. As a biologist, I had known nothing on the subject. Before the discovery of Henry cells, I was known as a reckless visionary and probably still am. I'm spontaneous and my basement is filled with partial discoveries and half filled machines. Margaret knows that whenever an idea hits me, I could sit down exactly where I am, scribbling on a napkin and chewing on my cigar for hours just to figure out what um, I was going to do. That's how I came up with my, my most important invention, the roller tube technique. When Mary came to me about time and myself, I wasn't ready to celebrate. They could have died any minute, but they didn't. And so after a while, I told my colleagues that I may have grown the first immortal human cell. And that, to which they replied, can I have them? Soon enough, my face was on WAM television, and I had to figure out a method of transferring the cells from all over the country. Everywhere I went, I, I carried a tube of Henrietta cells into my breast pocket. They are my precious babies with Tina and Larry. I wanted to move on from Henrietta cells and discover a new thing, but um, the, just as the cells went dying out of the media, I was constantly being interviewed, and people wanted to know who the patient's name was. That's how the idea of Helen Lane came into view. Um, the NFIP even asked for my help. The world has gone nuts over cell culture. Um, my name is Mary Kubitschek, and I was the assistant given the assignment of culturing Henrietta Lacks' cells the day that they were brought in. I was hired at Guy's Lab fresh out of college with a degree in physiology. When at 21, I was sent to interview at Guy's Lab, I didn't realize how tedious the work would be, always scraping and cutting in cells, which I just assumed would always just die. Until the day when, during my lunch hour, Guy brought Henrietta cells into the lab. Through the protocol, I sterilized the scaffold and cleaned the air in the cubicle before starting it on Henrietta cells. I cut the cells and placed them on chicken blood clots that I placed in the bottom of test tubes and then covered them with drops of culture medium. On each of the test tubes, I labeled four letters, H-E-L-A, HELA. I put the test tubes into Guy's incubator, just like I had with hundreds of other tubes before them. For a while, the HELA cells seemed to follow the path that each of the other that each of the other cells had taken before them. They showed little growth and even less promise. Then suddenly, the cells began to grow rapidly. They grew to fill the space that I allowed them to fill. Um, as long as they flew to more, the HeLa cells couldn't die. Mr. Guy was soon sending, sending the HeLa cells to his colleagues all over the country. My name is David Lack, but you can call me Dave. I was born and stillborn, but there was a midwife named Munchie who prayed over me, and now here I am. My grandfather, Tommy Lax, raised me in Clover with my cousin Henrietta, who later became my wife. We got married in 1941, a couple years after we had Lawrence and Elsie. I don't like to talk about Elsie, but the doctors say she had what is now called epilepsy, but we just thought she was deaf and dumb back then. During the war, I moved over to Sparrows Point, and Henrietta and the children followed shortly after. We had a life over at Turner Station, but once my daughter Dale was born, Henrietta started hurting. I took her over to John Hopkins, and they treated her for something going on, some type of cancer. The doctor treated her, then sent her back home, said she was fine now, and we had another baby, Joe. Elsie got too hard to handle, and we had to send her off to Crownsville. Then, Henrietta started hurting again, and we had to go in for regular treatment. She was in a lot of pain and died later that year. Them doctors killed her. I don't know what they did, but they killed her. I didn't want them doing cutting her up. 
They asked to and I said no. My cousin said it couldn't hurt, so then I let them. Them doctors never said nothing about keeping her alive in no tubes or growing no cells. All they told me was they wanted to do a toxy, see if they could help my children. And I've always known this much. They's the doctor, and you got to go by what they say. I don't know as much as they do. And them is the doctor, and you got to go by what they say. And then doctor said, if I gave them my old lady, they could use her to study that cancer and help my children, my grandchildren. They knew themselves was already growing when I come down after she died, but they didn't tell me nothing about that. But what else can you expect from John Hopkins? They just asked if they could cut her up to see about that cancer. I heard nothing about no cells. Now she's gone, then doctors killed her, and Elsie died a little later. Now I've got my own problems. I've gained green and diabetes, but I never got to see those cells. Never. I died of a stroke before I got to see all my life had done for the world, and that would have been something real nice.